All right. Uh, Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 3. We were there last week. We're going to be there again today. We're going to do a few other verses, but I want you guys to see it again. And some of you weren't there last week, so or here last week. So Luke chapter 3. Last week, we talked about the fire of God as being a metaphor for being on fire for God. Like we would talk about that today using that as a metaphor, specifically where, uh, like in order to get fire on earth, you have to have fuel, you have to have heat, and you have to have oxygen. Our metaphor last week was the fuel is your sin, the heat is the presence of God, and your obedience is the oxygen. And if you will obey when God, when you come close to God and His presence puts heat on your sin and it gets uncomfortable and you will obey what He asks you to do, not only will it consume the sin, but it will make you on fire for God. Now, the only problem with that metaphor is that I'm not sure I believe that's what John was talking about in Luke chapter 3, but I do believe uh, that that is a, a legitimate metaphor that we can use to describe. I believe that it does actually work that way. But Luke chapter 3, verse 16, uh, John the Baptist is speaking. Let's read it together here. I'm going to read out of the New Living. John answered them all by saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the straps of whose sandals I am not fit to unfasten. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So that baptism of fire, what is that? Last week we talked about it, you being on fire for God, but I believe that there's another metaphor that the, uh, that John's audience at that time would have probably understood it better as, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, in, don't turn to these, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to read them for time's sake, but I'll give you some references here if you want to jot them down. In Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9, God is speaking to the nation of Israel. And he says, I'm going to refine you in fire like the refiner refines silver or gold. That metaphor is repeated in Malachi chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, where God's wrath is like a refining fire purifying the people. And then in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10, God specifically says he will, he will refine us in the furnace of affliction. So there is a repeating metaphor in the Old Testament where we see that the wrath of God is like a refining fire. Now, what did they mean in the Old Testament? The ancient Jews of John's day would have understood it as a purification through trouble. Because that's what happened to the Jews. You know, from day one, I mean, God said, don't make any idols before me. And that's what they did right away. They made an idol and set it right before the mountain where God was and worshipped it like a bunch of idiots. And they broke all the rest of the commandments on a regular basis. But the one they broke most often was worshipping other gods. They finally got into the promised land. What did they do? They started worshipping the Baals and the Asherah poles and all these different things. And they had a, they had a, a, a problem with idolatry right up until Babylon came and defeated the Jerusalem, sacked it, and sent everyone into exile in Babylon. What's interesting, if you look at the history of Judaism, you'll notice that for those hundreds of years, they struggled with idolatry. Then they were gone for 70 years. When they came back, no, there was no more idolatry. <laughs> It was like all of a sudden they didn't have any problem with it anymore. They only worshiped God and Him only. In fact, it got so severe that during the Roman times, during the time that John is speaking, those Pharisees that he's actually speaking to, uh, they would get upset when Roman coins would have pagan symbols on them. And when they would fly their flag with a pagan symbol on it, they would get upset. I mean, there, no God other than God. So, they learned their lesson through the refiner's fire. And that's probably what John's audience would have understood it to mean. Because that's what they had experienced in the past, that there would be a fiery baptism, if you will. It wasn't called baptism because that's Greek and they, Greek didn't exist yet. But this, uh, this trial that they would become surrounded about, immersed in, and infused by difficulties that then purified them in the same way that gold and silver is purified. Now, most of you probably know how refiners refine gold and silver. You find gold and silver in mountains and rocks and stuff like that, and it comes in an ore form. 
And inside that ore are other metals, uh, usually uh, zinc, copper, nickel, things like that that are in there. And you can't, I mean, you could give, you could have, you know, molecular tweezers, you could pull out the individual pieces, but it's really difficult to separate those metals because they're all mixed together. So what the refiner would do, because they want pure, the pure gold and pure silver, silver, they would take it, grind it into a powder, mix it with a chemical called flux, and then they would heat it up until it melted. Now the flux doesn't melt and it would bind with all the metals except gold and silver, which I always thought was interesting. I want to know who came up with the flux. And so the, the gold or the nickel and the zinc and the copper and whatever else was in that ore would bind to the flux and then float to the surface. And that stuff was called dross and it's worthless. Uh, and so as it would float to the surface, the refiner would then skim off the dross and dump it out and he would keep doing that because as it would continue to heat, more and more uh, uh, dross would come to the surface. He'd scrape it off and he'd keep doing that. And he would do it until he could see his face perfectly in the reflection of the molten metal. Because it's not like water. It doesn't boil when it gets hot. It just stays flat. And so it would be a perfectly flat, shiny surface. And it would work just like a mirror. But if there was any impurities in there, you could see it with your eye because it would, it would mess up the image of your face. And so they would scrape off the dross until it was a complete perfect mirror image and they would take it off the heat or pour it into the mold or whatever they're going to do with it. That's how a refiner would refine gold and silver. And that experience, that a uh, trial through fire, trial or uh, a purification through problems is probably what John's uh, audience would have understood this metaphor to be rather than what we talked about last week. Now, what about the New Testament? You see, in the Old Testament, the most common use of the word fire was a literal physical fire where they described fire. Uh, the second most common was God's wrath as a fire. And then the third most common was the refiner's fire. In the New Testament, the most common uh, use of the word fire is to describe uh, uh, hell, basically. Uh, if, you, if you do a word search in the New Testament for fire, it's always, you know, the fire that never goes out, and the eternal fire, and the weeping and gnashing of teeth fire, and the, the lake of fire, and the, the valley of fire. I mean, all this fire of judgment day, okay? What happens to unbelievers if they are, if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, they go into the eternal fire. But it is not the only use of the term fire in the New Testament. In Mark chapter 9, verse 49, uh, Mark says that everyone will be salted with fire. Now, when I read that first as a kid, I always thought it was kind of weird because when I salt things, it's because I want to eat them and I want them to taste better. Okay, so you put the salt on it, and I, I just I always had an image of a salt shaker with little bitty fires coming out of it onto the food, and I just I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. Well, see, in the ancient times, salt wasn't just a seasoning; it was a, it was a um, preservative. Thank you. It would it would cure the meat, just like we have corned beef today and cured ham and stuff like that. They would cure things with salt so that they would last longer. Uh, and so when they're salting something with fire, it's probably not as much a seasoning as it is a purification process. So fire is a purifier. And then, of course, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, let me read that to you here. Let's do 6 and 7. So be truly glad. They, there is wonderful joy ahead, even though it is necessary for you to endure many trials for a while. Verse 7, these trials are only to test your faith, to show that it is strong and pure. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, and your faith is far more precious to God than mere gold. So if your faith remains strong after being tried by fiery trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on that day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So we see this idea of the fire purifying and testing our faith. Okay, so it's Old, it's old Testament, but it's also in New Testament. Okay, now let's take a second and figure out what I've been saying so far. If what I'm suggesting John was saying is that the fire is troubles and trials and problems and persecution that produce purification, that means that Jesus' baptism is not just going to be one of spirit, but one of problems? That doesn't make sense. I mean, don't I always say that God's a loving God and a good God and He wants great things for us, He wants to prosper us, He wants us to overcome, He wants to bless us and heal us. Then, then why would John tell the people that the one who's coming is mightier than me is going to baptize you with the Spirit and with problems? 
doesn't seem to line up there. In fact, in Luke chapter 12, you know, turn there. I want you guys to turn there. Luke chapter 12. You guys aren't far away. Luke 12, verse 49. Jesus had something to say himself about fire. John told the people about the fire of God or the fire of Jesus who's coming. He's going to baptize people with fire. But Jesus had something to say about it himself. Luke chapter 12, verse 49. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish that it were already kindled. Jesus longs, I love the King James, says, I long to cast. The, the, the idea there, that desire is like a, a passionate burning desire to cast fire on the earth. Jesus came that we might be overcomers. He came that we could have victory, that we could have life and life more abundant. What is he talking about bringing problems and trials and persecutions? Well, let me answer that question. First of all, I want to make a clarification statement. And I want everyone to understand this. You don't have to agree with me, but this is the way I believe. I believe that problems don't come from God. Okay? I believe that very sincerely. Let me tell you why. Because God doesn't do anything that he doesn't have to do. God doesn't have to create problems on earth. We got plenty as it is. Okay? God doesn't have to make you sick. You just got to hang out with a sick person to get sick. God doesn't have to make you get into a car crash. All it takes is one idiot drinking and driving to cause a car crash. You guys see what I'm saying? We cause enough problems on earth. God's not up in heaven going, well, I better add to this or they're never going to get any better. You know, God, he knows problems are going to happen. Okay? He is not the, the author of problems, okay? But he also doesn't waste anything. He uses everything he can because he cares so much about our character and our growth and our maturity that he will allow things to occur to us uh, and, and in us and all that kind of stuff in order for our benefit, okay? So I don't want you to get the idea that God's up there smiting people with a big smoke stick, all right? It doesn't work that way. God's up there watching the earth and there are times when we look at a circumstance and say, I don't want to go through that because it's bad. And God says, yeah, but you have no idea what you're going to look like on the other side. Let's go through this together. Okay? You guys follow me there? You understand the distinction? Okay. Let's move on then. In order to understand this metaphor a little better, and in order to understand why God would be so interested in us having problems, let me show you a little bit about fire. What does fire do? First of all, fire consumes. Uh, we talked about that a little bit last week, where fire, if you, if you will allow God's presence to heat up the problems in your life, the sin in your life, and, you, and then you obey, and it catches on fire and burns, it consumes the sin. Right. I had a dream last night and uh, um, I won't tell you the whole dream. I don't believe it was prophetic. But what was fascinating about the dream was as I was dreaming this, this uh, I can't remember what it was, but it caught on fire and it, it turned into a little lump of, you know, burnt up something. But and it looked like it still had mass to it. You ever done that before and you go over and touch it and it just falls into nothing, you know? It, it was just holding up because there wasn't anything knocking it over. That's what happens to our sin when we allow God to come into our life. It burns up that sin. And so the fire of God consumes sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul says, But there is going to come a time of testing. Testing, fire, okay, judgment. Look what it says here. A time of testing at the judgment day, to see, judgment day to see what kind of work each builder has done. Everyone's work will be put through the fire to see whether or not it keeps its value. What happens to works that are of no, of no value? They burn up. They're destroyed. There's a trick you can do when you're casting metal. You can create supports for things out of wax or uh, other materials that will burn away. Or, or not, not, excuse me, not not met casting, um, clay, when you're building with clay and you put the clay in the fire, it'll burn up the supports and they won't be there anymore as the object hardens. Uh, we had a friend who did that. Uh, the, the purpose is to, to, you know, you consume this object so that it's not there anymore. And so what stands remains. What's good remains. What's not doesn't. And so in ourselves, whether we accept Jesus or not, that's going to happen. The only difference is if we don't accept Jesus, there'll be nothing in us worth. Nothing in us that can survive. And we will be consumed. And then we will spend eternity in that consumption, if you will. 
So the fire of God consumes sin. Now let me show you something neat here. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, I, oh, I didn't write it down. Okay, well anyway, um, I think I can quote it for you here. It says that, uh, um, do I have that right? Is that the right one? Yeah, okay. He who, he who suffers in his body is done with sin. Now I love that verse because he who suffers in his body is done with sin. What does that mean? Have you ever suffered for your sin? You ever done something wrong and suffered for it? How quickly do you want to do that sin again? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when you're little kids, you know, and, and you, you do something wrong and daddy spanks you real hard and you're like, I'm never doing that again. You know, you, that's the last thing on your mind you want to do. And when we suffer for the things that we do wrong, our tendency is to, to separate ourselves from them. And so one of the reasons why God wants the fire to come on us is because when we suffer for our sins, we will repent and turn away from them, those sins. Let me give you an example. Uh, this isn't necessarily a sin, but it's not good for you. Um, my grandmother and grandfather on my dad's side used to smoke, okay? And when my grandmother had a heart attack, she quit smoking. She said, that's it, I'm done with smoking. I'm finished with this, and she quit. I mean, of course, you're in the hospital for a while, and you can't smoke there, so, you know, kind of helped a little bit, but uh, she decided she was done. Grandpa didn't quit smoking. Now, he smoked outside because he didn't want to hurt Grandma, but he didn't quit smoking. A few years later, he had a heart attack, Then he quit smoking. You see, it wasn't enough to see somebody else's pain to cause him to change his behavior. He had to suffer himself in his body and go, you know, that really hurt. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do this anymore. You know what? Uh, they, they say that your first heart attack is the most healthy thing that can happen to you. Because once you have your first heart attack, you change the way you eat, you change the way you live, you start exercising because you've gone through the pain of the experience. You never want that to happen again. And so one of the reasons why God, why Jesus says, I've got fire coming to the earth and I can't wait for it to be kindled is because he knows that when we suffer for our own sins, we turn away from those sins a lot easier. Now, it doesn't work every time, but it is certainly a good motivator. All right, so that's one reason why, because when we suffer in our bodies, we're done with sin. Now, when we suffer in our bodies for other reasons that are not related to our sin, it can help too. Now, there are times when we're going through suffering and we cry out to God for assistance. In that close time with God, we don't think much about sinning. We're too focused on God. Okay, so it works both, excuse me, it works both ways. All right, so number one, fire consumes. Number two, fire purifies. Um, you know, we use um, hand sanitizer to clean our hands and stuff like that, you know, and we, we clean the cabinets with hand sanitizer, but the best way to kill germs is heat. I mean, you know, it says kills 99.9% .9 of germs. Yeah, but you can kill them all if you stick it in the oven, <laughs> you know. I mean, they, they can't survive heat. And fire purifies things. It cleanses them. Like I said last week, there's nothing biologically cleaner than ash. Okay, once it's burned up, there's nothing living left on it, okay, because it consumes all living things that are bad for you. And so fire purifies. Now, this goes back to the dross example. As we go through suffering, okay, the, the impurities in our life come to the surface. And I've used this example before, but I'll use it again because it's me. I don't have to pick on anybody else. Uh, when Karen and I went through the trials of Ellis, our time in Ellis, that were so difficult, I found out that I really wasn't that nice of a guy. You know, I thought I was this nice, generous, kind, loving, affectionate person, and I'm always this good guy, you know, and, and I love everybody, and I got patience, until I wasn't comfortable anymore. And then all of a sudden selfishness and pride and arrogance and cruelty and all of these things started to come to the surface. I remember one day, I um, I can't remember how I worded it, but I told God, I said, this isn't fair. These problems are causing sin in my life. You know, you're allowing me to go through this difficult time. It's causing sin in my life. So that was one of my reasons to try to get God to get me out of this mess was because it's causing me to sin. And I'll never forget it. He didn't say anything at the time, but through a, uh, through a preacher called uh, John Bevere, I learned later, he said, sin doesn't produce, or uh, excuse me, trials don't produce sin in your life. They just make it show up. You know, you ever got into a hotel room with one of them black lights? If you haven't, don't. <laughs> you won't, you'll sleep in the bathtub, okay? 
You don't want to know what's in them hotel rooms, okay? Uh, it, it's, it's dirty. Doesn't care how clean it looks or smells. It's not clean, okay? And that light shows all of the impurities in the room. We don't want to know that they're there, okay? We won't go on long our merry way, sleep in that bed, assuming that everything's clean, okay? But it's not. And in our lives, we don't want to go through the trials and troubles because it brings out the sin in us. It brings that dross to the surface, and now we can see it, and we don't like what we see. We're like, I don't. I, man, I, I was, when I realized that it was me that had all those problems and not my circumstances, when I realized that even though I thought I was a very generous person, I was extremely stingy, and even though I thought I was a kind person, I was extremely cruel, and even though I thought I was a patient person, okay, actually, I didn't think that one. I knew I wasn't a patient person. That one, that one, and I'm still working on that one. But even though I thought I was good, that pain brought the dross to the surface and I could see my impurities for what they are, or for what they were. Many of them uh, God has taken off because I cooperated. He, I allowed him to scrape that dross off. You know what's kind of neat about that illustration? When the, when the pure, or, um, uh, when the refiner is scraping all of the dross off, he waits until he can see his face in that molten metal. When you scrape off all the garbage in your life and all the sin in your life, you know what shows up at the end? God's face. He can see his face in that. And he says, now you're good. Now go show the world my face. And one of the reasons why the American church is doing such a poor job of bringing people into the fold is because we people look at us, they don't see Jesus. They see us. They see our dross. We need to allow the heat, the, the, the fire of problems and the fire of persecution and troubles to clean us off. You want to know why the persecuted church grows faster than any other area? Because they're constantly under heat. You know, when you, you can heat up, scrape up some of the dross, then let it cool, and some of that impurity will remain in there. You heat it up again, put more flux in it, dross comes up to the surface, you can scrape it off. These guys are always melted, because they're always under pressure, always under problems, and so it's so much easier for them to be purified, and then when people walk by, they go, man, son, you got something I want. You look good, what is that? That's the face of God. We need to do that as Americans, but we're so busy trying to solve our problems that we don't allow those problems to purify us. Okay, so number one, it consumes us, or consumes sin, excuse me. Number two, it purifies us. Number three, it strengthens and matures us. I already read 1 Corinthians 3.13, but the, you know, the idea of removing the weak stuff. You know, you build a house out of wood and straw and hay, but if you build part of it out of brick, you burn away the rest of the stuff, that brick will remain because it's strong enough to sustain the fire. So it strengthens us. It leaves what's strong. Let me show you something else, too. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, apparently I didn't write that one down either. Okay, uh, Paul is telling Timothy to stir up the gifts that are inside of him, and that, that uh, stirring metaphor is to stir up a fire. So he's talking about this fire. The fire of God is not just the troubles and trials of our life. It is the inner strength we receive from God if we keep it stirred up. Okay, another one here. Uh, is from Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Now, I want you guys to turn there. Let's all turn there. Revelation 3. It's at the end of the book. Unless you have a big concordance, then it's like almost at the end of the book. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3. In the first four chapters of Revelation, uh, God is, well, Jesus, I guess, is speaking to the churches. All right, the churches of Asia Minor. And he has a word for each one. And uh, uh, Laodicea, which is what we see in Romans, or Revelation chapter 3, is the only church that, no, it's one of two churches that didn't get a good word. You know, a lot of the churches say, hey, you got this wrong, but you got this going good. Poor, the poor Laodiceans, they were doing everything wrong. <laughs> Let me show you why. Revelation 3, starting in verse 15. Jesus is speaking to him. He says, I know all the things you do that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been, re has been refined or purified by fire. Then you will be rich. What's Paul, or uh, what's Jesus talking about here in the book of Revelation? Well, first of all, notice what the problem is. They didn't have any heat. They were lukewarm Christians. They weren't even cold. They just, they're just kind of hanging out. You know anybody like that? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah. 
What, do you, what does that mean? Oh, I believe in Jesus. Doesn't mean anything else to me. I mean, I don't do anything about it. Just waiting to die, I guess, so I can go to heaven and get my reward for hanging out on earth for my life. They're lukewarm. They're not hot. They're not cold. These people were not hot. They were missing the heat. And look at what it says. Verse 16. But since you are like lukewarm water, I will spit you out of my, my out of my mouth. Now we can talk about metaphors all day long, try to figure out what it means to be lukewarm. But look, we get the answer in verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. That's what being lukewarm means. I am sufficient in myself. And that's real easy for Americans. That's one of the reasons why I like the letter to the Laodicean church. Because it reflects America so well. You know, the, uh, if you don't know, the, the city of Laodicea was actually a very wealthy city. It was a trading city. So there was all kinds of money, like the United States. And like most prosperous nations, they have decided, I don't need anything else. I got me. And I'm good enough. I don't need God to provide for me. I don't need God to protect me because my money can do that for me. I don't need God to purify me because I'm good enough as it is. I don't need anything. And then verse uh, 18, or well, I guess the second half of verse 17, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now, what's the solution to this? Verse 18, I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. What does it mean to buy gold from God that has been purified by fire? If you go to verse 19, which I have right here, this is the next verse down. It says, I am the one, this is Jesus, I am the one who corrects and disciplines everyone I love. So now we got problems, okay, uncomfortableness, if you will. Uh, uh, be diligent and turn from your indifference. What's the problem the Laodiceans had? They were apathetic. They didn't care. They thought they were okay. They thought they were self-sufficient. I don't need God. So what was his solution? Buy from me gold refined by fire. The correction of God, which is the use of difficulty, difficult circumstances, to bring to the surface the problems of ourselves, the sin in our life that he can then, that we can then allow him to remove will purify us and make us hot. You know, a lot of American Christians think they're rich. I love, I mean, rich in spiritual matters. Um, I was reading, no, no, I was talking to a, uh, to a missionary, a friend of ours, who went to South Africa for several years with his wife. And uh, I was chatting with him about missionaries and, and, you know, what the problems. I said, what's the biggest problem in Africa, South Africa, where he was? Well, what's the biggest problem? Just tell me what it is. And he said, the biggest is heresy. But he said, you know, another big problem that we have over there are American Christians. Because they'll come over and say, I'm here to fix your life. I will take care of everything you need because I'm an American. And one of the things Karen noticed when she was in Kenya is that the Kenyans have that attitude. They've been trained to think that the white man's here. It's all going to be okay now. You see, they are replacing God with a man. They are uh, basically idolatry. But what does that mean about the American Christian? We think we're God's solution to everything. Well, I just send them a bunch of money. They'll be okay. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll even go over there and encourage them, tell them, tell them how awesome God is and how awesome they are, and they'll be just fine because I am there to give to them. We think we're so rich. Go talk to the South Koreans, ask them how rich the American church is. They make fun of us <laughs> because we are pitiable, blind, naked, weak, poor, why? Because we haven't bought gold refined by fire. We've bought an, an, uh, an, uh, a fake gold that is actually real gold in life, but it's fake gold in reality. And we have bought into that thinking that's going to be enough for us. We are indifferent. We are lukewarm because we think we have enough. So when we allow ourselves to be refined by fire, we become truly strong. We become truly rich. We become truly capable. And what is that? I'd say probably the easiest way to describe it in one word is humility. 
when we truly understand what humility is, then we can be strong. Let's do the last one. Fire is good for us because it consumes sin, it purifies us, it strengthens us and makes us grow up, and then lastly, it shines out to the world. We talked about this a little bit last week, but light, fire, or excuse me, fire produces light. It shines out to the world. And when we are on fire for God, like we talked about last week, we shine out to the world. But what about this week? Now we're talking about fire as troubles. How can our lives in miserable circumstances be a light to the world? And I remember I was going through this stuff, you know, writing down what I thought God was saying. And I got to that last one because he had given me all the points ahead of time. And I said, you know, I know fire shines out, God, but this one really doesn't fit in the metaphor. And I was ready to delete it. I mean, three points is enough. You don't need four. And uh, I said, you know, I'm just going to leave this one alone. And God said, no, meditate on that for a little while. So I meditated on it. I said, okay, well, what's the deal? What does it mean? <laughs> Finally, he gave me the answer because he knew I wasn't going to get it. I think he was making fun of me. But uh, he said, when you're strong under pressure, when you are loving under fire, and when you are giving in adversity, the world looks at you and says, what do you have? You know, everyone in the world suffers. We always suffer. But when we are suffering, if we behave like the rest of the world, we won't draw attention to ourselves. But if when we are suffering, we still give glory to God and we still have the character uh, of God and, and the gifts, or excuse me, the fruits of the Spirit, even while we're suffering, the world says, what do you have? I mean, man, when... When I'm sick, I'm miserable and complaining all the time. Or, or when I'm, uh, when, when we had our financial problems, I was always griping at everyone and I got mean and I wasn't pleasant. I wasn't helpful. My favorite is the giving in, uh, what was it? Giving in adversity. You know, uh, I remember when Karen and I were in, uh, Fredonia getting ready to go to TFC, there was a woman there who was on, uh, a disability and she, she said, I'll give you, I'll give, that's all I got, but I'll give you guys $5 a month. I thought, what a light. I mean, this woman doesn't have any money. And she's still giving us money. See, she was shining because she was willing to give when she didn't have anything. And when we are going through difficult circumstances and we are able to have the character of God in those circumstances, we shine. Now, I want to be careful that you guys don't take this the wrong way because I know some of you will. This does not mean that you get to reject assistance when you need it. Receiving is a, is a form of blessing as well. And when you are gracious in reception, that also tells people something. There's a difference between receiving something with grace and receiving it out of a, out of a sense of oblig, or a, a sense of entitlement. Okay. I'm not talking about entitlement, but when we are willing to receive, that also shines out to the world. So don't think that, well, I just don't need anything. No, you're ripping someone off. They can bless you and get blessed themselves. Don't cheat them out of their blessing, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is maintaining the character of God during difficult times. When you are struggling and in pain and can still love other people, they will look at you and say, you got something I want because I want to be that happy when I'm going through problems too. You see what I'm saying? So the love, or excuse me, the fire of God shines out to the world even in difficult times because people will see us do the impossible. And they will ask, what do you have? So what does this mean? That we should pray for difficult circumstances? No, I don't think so. I don't think God would have us do that. But I do believe that we need to use, or I say more specifically, allow God to use those difficult circumstances in our lives to purify ourselves. Because you can bring dross to the surface and then just let it cool and not take it off. And it's still a chunk of metal with impurities in it. Okay? You have to scrape the dross off when it's hot or it won't come off. And sometimes we go through difficult circumstances and we just grit our teeth and we suffer through it and then it's over and it's like, okay, let's go back to my life. That's not what was supposed to happen. You just wasted pain. Don't waste pain. Pain is terrible. I hate pain. But I'm not going to waste it because if I'm going to have to go through it, I might as well get something good out of it. Amen? <laughs> if you're going to suffer, at least get something out of it. When you go through the difficult times, uh, when you go through uh, troubles, persecutions, Struggles with relationships, struggles with finances, struggles with uh, your own personal uh, attitude or whatever it is. And you, that stuff starts to come up to the surface. Don't ignore it. Don't pretend it's not there. Ask God, how do we get this off? How do we get this out of here? And he'll show you. 
You'll come out the other side shining like the face of God. And that's what I want. I want to look more and more like God every day. You know, one of the biggest questions atheists ask is, how could a loving God allow pain and suffering in the world? Now, my favorite answer is, God doesn't cause pain and suffering. Other people do. But my second favorite answer is this. In a broken world, you got to use something to fix it. And you can't weld two pieces of broken metal back together without a lot of heat. And if he's going to put us back together, it's going to take heat. And that pain and suffering is an excellent way to put us back together. I mean, God's up in heaven saying, these guys are going to suffer. We might as well get something out of it. Let's put them back together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have ordained in life the victory through Jesus Christ. But I also thank you, Lord, that in your grace and your wisdom, that you've also allowed difficulties, that we might see our sin for what, we, for what it is, that we might have the opportunity to remove it. Father, I pray not that trials and problems come, Lord, I know they will, but that when they do, we can use those opportunities to be blessed by purification, that the sin in us would be consumed, that we would be strengthened and matured, and that we might shine forth a light into the world, that the people in this community and in this area and all across the world would see your love and your goodness and your kindness, and, and that they would see that in us and turn to you to be saved. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.